They were both Methodist missionaries and they worked for the Red Cross. And um, they actually met one over, over there, which is quite unusual uh, for, for people like that, because most people married and then they went over and did that, but they met there. And he was a doctor in Shanxi province and he was quite famous. And if you kind of pop up there now, there's a hospital that you kind of set up. Mm. And one day, um, he was famous enough to have a book written about him called Harry Wyatt of Shanxi. And one day he was asked to go and take some medical supplies to another province and on the way uh, they got, uh, well, they got ambushed by the kind of communists who thought they were Japanese, so uh, they basically all got killed and uh, tra very tragically and uh, he got buried and uh, when the people got to, got to the sideline the next day there was just a load of graves with, with man, woman written on pieces of paper over where they were, so, so that was quite, it was, well, it was appalling. Yeah, yeah. How posh are you? I don't know, I met a poor person once, they bounced off the front of my windscreen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've seen, obviously I've read the book and I've seen the picture there. There's only a little snapshot of that house, of that mansion. I think it's the, it's the West Wing. It obviously is, you yeah. couldn't actually get the whole house yeah. in, in one shot. It's true. And it's, and yeah, well, because I'm thinking, obviously, I mean, it's not for Dom, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And kind of the way that you're talking about that upbringing, I'm thinking with somebody with such eccentricity and somebody with that kind of intensity of doing those kind of things, was he there for you at any time? Oh, uh, well, my dad, he, he kind of regarded us as if, uh, with, I'm, one, I'm the youngest of seven, 
And he kind of regarded us as if like we were flowers and somehow this pollen had got spread over the stamen, you know, and all these children had got... He was very Rousseau-esque kind of upbringing, you know. He, uh, he, uh, it was a bit like the Adams family, you know, it was a bit like that. Because I'm the youngest of seven and like you, you were dragged up by your kind of nearest and dearest. But he used to work during the night time and sleep during the day and he, he wrote on, he worked on these books. And he, uh, so it was quite clear to us that we were not to do languages, we were not to do acad academia. Mm. So actually, when you're working under that kind of slightly bullying situation, music's actually a very good thing to do, because you can actually play music quietly. Yeah. So, and it's not something that he did. Right. So well, that's what I'm saying, that's what I'm, yeah. So you felt as though, really, you couldn't have that much of a kind of a relationship then? Because of what he was doing, was a force he was doing action. what he was, he was doing. That's what I'm saying. It was like a vortex of what he was doing with his uh, the intensity of what he, he just was wasn't doing. there. You know, I mean, no, like yeah, three yeah. three day yeah. a week, he just fucked off to London and stayed in his <laughs> stayed in his flat in London and probably bedded eighteen year old students. You know, that's yeah. the kind of the sort of thing he did, yeah, which he did do with gusto. You know, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So after that, was A levels and then up to Manchester. Yeah. So what brought you up here? Well, I thought it would be easier. Apart from the obvious. Well, you know, in you know. After listening to John Peel on some little radio station, hearing bands like the Smiths, you know, I heard the Smiths the first time they were played. And John Peel, you know, I just wanted to go there. I just wanted to go to the city that Joy Division were from, the Buzzcocks were from, Magazine were from, the Smiths were from. How, you know, how could you not want to be in that city? And it was quite depressed at that time, but it seemed like a, it seemed like a good place to go because it was a far, you know, you've got to get away from all that, all that growing up stuff. You just want to go somewhere, hundred and. 80 miles away and set yourself up and not be the youngest brother, just be a faceless person in a crowd of a big city, a big musical city. Right, so it's straight into Hume, and then uh, likewise, and then you joined a band, likewise, too, with the obviously it was too much Texas, and then you uh, started working at the Hass. Good times. Amazing times. I mean, it was a quiet night when someone didn't get shot in the queue outside. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it, was, it was always like that, was it? It was, it was pretty quiet. I remember if there was this many people in the house, it would have been rammed. Oh, there would have been rammed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, it was great that said. I mean, we, Suzanne uh, worked in the, uh, the canteen and she managed us, so she got us all jobs working in there. And, and I remember one thing that in Manchester, she did like a burger, and the burger had like salad in it. That's like big news, that was like Jamie Oliver shit, that, you know what I mean? I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like, you know, dining with Henry VIII, you know, having a burger with lettuce and stuff like that. But it was, yeah, it was, uh, uh, there were some great nights there. I mean, obviously it was like before, it was in the house thing was kicking off and it was very eclectic. And it's like, I said, I've said in the book, it was like the biggest, most eclectic jukebox in the world, you know, mm -hmm. it, was, it was fantastic. And, you know, relatively close to people like Tony Wilson, relatively close to people like Mike Pickering, close to people like Rob Gretton. Uh, you know, you know. I, I, I walked around there because I glass collected, and the glass collecting, what a, you know, what a, it was a great place to, to be because you could just walk out around that as a stage, and uh, you could really, you know, you could, it was a, it was it was a fantastic place. But I thought people will write books about this scene because it's a really, it's like uh, well, it's like the factory, it's like the yeah. Warhol, or I don't know. It was, it was, uh, you know, and uh, you know, it's really sad that a lot of those. I mean, I don't think it's sad that the Hacienda closed down because it was never a building. It was like a, it was a communion of people yeah. who were there. But I do think, having said that, I do think it's a bit sad that pulling the BBC building down, you know, I still was looking at that yesterday, and it's another like iconic place where it's just a bit sad. I'm not sad they pulled the Hacienda down, but I'm sad they're pulling that down, because that's like a, the Granada building, the BBC building, like, these big iconic buildings, you know. Yeah, no, but you're right, though, it's more about the people than the actual... The, the bricks and mortar, though, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, it's the movement of the people, yeah. you know, we'll just take it somewhere else. Yeah, and the boardwalk as well, you know, I mean, we, we played in the boardwalk with Tourist Texas and we supported, like, the House of Love and we supported the Beloved. So, you know, I think we were probably quite good because the bands we played with were, and we supported New Order and Hacienda, who was, uh, I was, and the Peter Hook's bass amps, so were like, uh, like the Alps. You know, look at the Alps on that, do you know what I mean? Well, all right, we're talking about the Inspirals. So you go for the audition, uh, and uh, you're pretty much, well, obviously you're in, uh, you go to record the first track and they find out you've got a lisp. Yeah, well, they didn't tell me for three weeks that I was in the band, you know. Right. So, uh, so I turned up for two or three rehearsals, went on to Square One in Barry, and uh, so anyway, so I get called in by the gaffer, he's Clint, you know, he goes, he goes, you got a lisp. I says, it's too late, I'm in the fucking band now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't he know? Didn't he? Uh, I, I didn't know, know you had. Well, Graham, when Have I you? did. <laughs> I'll tell you, Graham, on the second album, he wrote a song that has the line in it, Gentle silence sees sadness subside. So I think someone was taking the fist slightly. <laughs> The song that Clint wrote, because I used to live in, uh, I used to live in this, 
uh, workroom uh, where uh, make clothes in the daytime and nighttime we used to uh, sleep in the workroom where they made clothes and it's just above the place it's just below the place where the stone roses had that shot done with all the paint on it and when the pipe broke all the all the all the paint came down through the ceiling went all over a bike so we had like a psychedelic bike for a while after that but um, so I, I used to uh, live in this workroom and um, used to get dropped off there after working at the Hacienda and uh, all the people thought I was a rent boy but I was living there obviously honestly uh, but anyway it's a song that Clint wrote about what he saw out of the window Help her. 
There's not a thing that I can do about it. I guess I'll just go home and write a song about it. Song about it. Write about it. When you stand inside the it's a different world from the world you knew when the tell buys me little girls. It's a cold and trembling girl leans into a strange call. No some spoken words to and no seem travel sitting there. as well with the Inspirers and I really like those kind of not mundane things but even down to picking uh, who's going to get dropped first at home because of course you know everybody in a band's equal but some are more equal than others <laughs> it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't just that what it was was that a lot of them were living at home with their mums and dads you know so yeah so living in this yeah but why should they get dropped off before me Suddenly had a rush back, I've suddenly gone back like 16 years, but I feel really good about it. Uh, but the thing was that we were always joking that when they were building the M60, that at that time bits of it were called the M63, and we always joked that, that, that when they connected all up, we'd split up, which is exactly what happened, you know. But um, it's just as a heart, a band is a family, isn't it? You yeah. Know? And I think that uh, Clint was like the dad, Graham was like the mum, and... Uh, I don't know, Martin is probably like something like Jeremy Kyle or something like that, do you know what I mean? But uh, no, they're all, they're all like, it's like a family, you know, and there is, it's a pecking order. They're, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a band or you're a set of plasters or, or you work at, I don't know, Jodrell Bank, although probably no one works at Jodrell Bank now, but there's a hierarchy in there. So yeah, and others, but, but I, sort of say, I like the fact that you're kind of addressing those, those things that people don't, of course, when people go and see a band, they go and see the band, they don't see all the machinations of kind of what's going on behind the scenes and those kind of things, I, I thought that you brought them out really well. Well, thank Be you. Because yeah. it's something that, it's, that's your life. You know, I think we said before, you know, when you go to bed and you see his face and you wake up and you see his face and then you're with him for the next yeah, 24 I mean, hours. I mean, yeah, I mean, for the next 24 hours. Being in a band, I mean, the thing is, I don't want to make it sound like it was a negative thing because, uh, you know, part of it is the big, brutalisation of being in a band. You can join the army or you can join a band, can't you? You know, it's a brutalising experience, I think, you know. And But having said that, you know, I think you, you certainly, uh, I, I mean, I don't think there's anyone out of that band who isn't genuinely really funny. And I think actually Graham and Clint are probably the two funniest people I've ever met in all my life. They're very funny. I that you hook up with Jem Taylor. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, it's the first incarnation of The Lovers. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, a weight off your shoulders? Are you feeling free? Are you feeling like, you know, because I know that when I left the Smiths it was like, great, okay, now I can just carry on and, and get something else done now. Or were you like, oh shit? I was a bit like shit really because there's a story in the book, you know, that in 1995, you know, we had this conversation and, you know, Graham didn't want to continue with the band. I think retrospect to you was right, you know, I think that's right, you know, but, but I did say to Craig, I said, like, if you're like, a, if you're a fighter, you know, if you're a boxer or something and you get knocked down, you have to get straight up. And Craig said, no, we're staying down. And so at the age of sort of 30, I had three kids under the age of three, I couldn't really go and work, you know, at McDonald's, you know. So, and I remember being very down in 95 and, um, uh, eating, we were given this chocolate trivial pursuits game and it was like a pop one and uh, I ate the last one and on the wrapper it said what band did Noel Gallagher used to roadie for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. So, there's a lot of that in the book, there's a lot of, level of there's a lot of levels of irony in the book, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, there's I'm not going to go into it, there's a story about John Craven in there, you know, 
know. We don't know because people are going to buy it. <laughs> don't tell them everything. So then, uh, so you've sold, uh, performing solo is uh, solo artist it's Tom Hingley. Yeah. And then uh, Steve Hamlin uh, yeah. arrives on the scene. And then Paul and finally Kelly, is it Hingley? Knee Wood. It is, yeah. And, uh, and Andrew telling the guitar. But just prior to that, I, I spoke to Simon Wollstonecroft, ex Fall member, mm. and I asked him what he was up to. And he said, oh, I'll speak to uh, Tom Hingley. And uh, he's looking for a drummer. And I said, Is he now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is actually true that you. And, and, yeah, and I phoned you up and yeah. I said, What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> what I about me? And you said, I didn't have the temerity. And I said, Okay, fair enough. Phone right. down. Dictionary out. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck does temerity mean? <laughs> to be honest, I thought it was somewhere in China. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so of course you get the yeah, so you get the band together and everything's cool, and then uh, it's no good now. It's too late. It's over. We're really sorry. Yeah, and yeah. okay, we'll, we'll, talk talk about about we'll talk about it in public. Yeah. Right, yeah, don't worry. It's too late. Part of what I was saying about the inspiring thing, I'm very proud of what I did. I, I love the idea of writing books. I love the idea of doing radio. I love the idea of, you know, I'm 47 now. It's time to do different stuff. You know, and I think at the age of 10, if you'd said to me, because my dad used to write books, you know. My brother Richard writes archaeological books, uh, and uh, so it's in the blood really to write books. And but if you said to me at the age of ten, like you can either uh, you know write a book and find someone foolish enough to publish it and put it out, you know, and it will sell like you know it will sell a load of copies or whatever. I don't like comments around and not into music at all because I think that writing is like music and technicolor because you really have the opportunity to completely change the way. I mean, music is is you know, it's, it's massive, but writing is almost even it's more commanding as an art form than music is, I think, because you really do, you know, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, but I think the hand that, you know, that holds the middle, I think, rules the world, I think writing is, you know, and it, you know, writing, it doesn't, you know, you write your first book, it doesn't have to be original, uh, it doesn't, it, it just has to be interesting, it has to be interesting. Yeah, well, well, on that note, Tom, <laughs> and your book certainly is. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a it's a right riveting read. Oh, it's, it's, I like I said, there's so many kind of people that are involved. I mean, I find it really interesting because there's so many people that I've met along the way, and even when you you, you kind of try and uh, cover those people's tracks by calling them Mr. P, I know him. <laughs> I know who it is. <laughs> so, oh, you, mean, you mean the accountant who got the baseball bat out? Yes, from OJ's. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I know who that is. Well, it's OJ's. We don't mean the popular seventies disco band. It's important <laughs> if anyone's filming. But it's, that. but it's, uh, no, it's a, it's a brilliant book because it, it covers just about every kind of uh, base for me. And um, what are you doing now? Anyway, listen, Tom. Thanks very much for that. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much. Nice right. one. Way three years ago, he had uh, had dementia. I think he had like Parkinson's or something like this. And uh, he was quite funny. My dad he used to say things like, "You can't believe how much antidepressants in Peru Christmas." <laughs> and when he was 17, he went around Germany and Italy and Austria just before the outbreak of the Second World War. And although he didn't cause it, he did have quite a bad temper, so it probably didn't help things very much. And uh, in 1990, he came to Reading Festival uh, with my mum. I got like a music industry card to pick him up in Oxford and take him to Reading. And uh, when they got there, John Peel bought them both a drink, which I think is pretty cool. So we got a round of applause with John Peel, can't we? That's yeah. a That's a and uh, as we played them to 80,000 people, and uh, there was actually, <laughs> I don't know if it was inspired by the book, but Noel was saying yesterday, he was asked what the worst thing he'd had to do while Roading for spiral carpets, and he said, running behind this pantomime cow at Reading Festival in 1990, shaking an udder. That was like one of the things he said was the worst thing he'd ever had to do. But anyway, um, so anyway, we played this gig to 80,000 people, and I said to my dad afterwards, I said, what did you think of the gig? And he gave me the most bizarre review I've ever had. He said, uh, 
The last time I saw an audience reacting like that, Thomas, was when I saw Mussolini giving a speech in Rome in 1939. <laughs> so this song's dedicated to my dad. It's dedicated to anyone who's lost their mum and dad or anyone in the family. So thanks very much.
Without any echo, thanks very much for coming. Um, I'm sure you're probably aware what, what you're here for. Um, if you don't know me from Adam, my name's Dave Simpson. Uh, I write for The Guardian about music. Um, I've written about music for a very long time, um, since the early 90s, um, which is when the Inspiral Carpets were in their heyday. And one of my earliest reviews, I do vividly remember being sent to exotic Cambridge to review the Inspirals and uh, writing a sort of eulogy really. Um, and the headline was Magic Carpets. And it's funny how things stick in your mind, but I still remember that. Um, and obviously at that point you don't realise that in probably 20, what is it, 24 years later, you'd be sat in a field in Yorkshire talking to the man who was on the stage at the time, Mr. Tom Hingley. You won't really need much Was, was again and currently isn't the singer in the Inspiral Carpets. We will talk about that later on. Um, but he's written a very, very absorbing book called Carpet Burns about his, his life really and about his time in the band. Um, it's, it's, it's a real warts and all expose really of how it feels to be in a band that, that become very, very popular very quickly. Um, and then aren't so popular after, after that. So it's a real rise and fall, which happens to everybody, basically, you know, whoever you are. Um, and it's a, it's a very frank expose. It's also hilariously funny, and it's got a lot of very uh, comical anecdotes. And I thought we'd start off, um, I mean, some of you might know that I'm a massive fan of The Fall. Um, and I was very curious to read Tom's book, because I knew that they, the Inspirals did a single with Marky e. Smith from The Fall in the early 90s, and, and I was intrigued to find out what that experience was like. Um, and, and, and I kind of know some of that from the book really. Um, it basically starts off with Mark E. Smith arriving at the studio, this is the singer from The Fall in case any of you don't know, um, an hour late and demanding £55 to pay the taxi driver. Um, and then they go on to make a video together and the, the line, one of, the fa one of my most favourite lines from the book is, describes this moment and it says, after upsetting the lady at the small hotel in Swiss Cottage by being rude, Mark started drinking at 8am. <laughs> and that kind of does set up the mood, really, for, for what it was like working with Mark E. Smith, I imagine. Uh, he was very like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and my, dad was, uh, he, my dad was like an Oxford academic, and uh, he, he, uh, yeah, he was very literary and very intelligent and I think Mark chimed a lot with my dad, he was quite a bit with my father, he was like a slightly more reasonable version <laughs> of my father, to be honest, I think. That's one way of putting it, at one, at one point when, when you're making a video he manages to insert the microphone into the cameraman's eye. Yeah. It was, that, was that pretty much par for the course in a day with Mark? I think he might have thought he was on the golden shot or something, you know, left a bit right, a bit of fire. Uh, I just think he didn't like making videos, so he thought he might try and bring the process to like a, a premature end, but the uh, cameraman wasn't having any of it, he just got straight back on, so <laughs> kept on filming. But it was, uh, it was, it was great actually, because um, I think Mark, he, he's always a supporter of the underdog, I think, and the, mm -hmm. I mean, not all journalists were as kind as you were, Dave, and, and uh, you know, he, he kind of, he, he said he'd do a single with us because he really liked Inspiral Carpets because the band were influenced by, you know, psychedelic bands like The Seeds and, mm -hmm. and all that lot, and so he 
was perfectly happy to do a track with us because he knew that it would just make a lot of journalists look really stupid, which is always a good thing to do, you know, because at the end of the day, if you're an artist and you're a musician, it's your job to disrupt the orthodoxy. Mm. And uh, so I think it was there's some funny things that happened uh, on that. Uh, later on, we then did Top of the Pops with him and there's a whole load of things that happened there as well. But, uh, you know, so it was... It was uh, very exciting to see him singing in the studio. I mean, that was that was something special. And, and a certain irony that in his career lasting, I think, 30, 37 years, I think it now is, that's the only time he's been on top of the Pops. We well, he, with you, not with the fall. He nearly wasn't on top of the Pops because uh, after he did the first two run-throughs, you got like you got like the director, you got the director of the program. He's in a part of the building that you can't see, and they didn't want him on the show. So we had to. So like our plugger, who's a very nice woman called Nikki, said. Uh, they don't want him on the show and we basically had to say we are going to have him on the show or we're just not going to do the show and that's the trouble with the rock and roll business it's very it's always it's very conservative it always moves away from anything that's challenging or difficult you know and the bbc at that time was sort of civil service broadcasting so like if you step out of line or you don't do exactly what you're supposed to do you're not going to be on the show so we had to kind of dig our heels in really on that one because the thing about them trying to take mark off top of the pops is there's three sort of notable things about that the first thing is who's going to tell him <laughs> the second one is who's going to tell him and the third one is, it's the only time it's ever going to happen. I mean, it might, it might be happening right now in some kind of parallel universe, you know, uh, but I don't think it is. <laughs> so, you know, it's the thing is to get, because the record company said to us, you know, I say in the book, it's like, you know, Mrs. Beaton, you know, when Mrs. Mrs. Beaton said, when you're making hair stew, like first get your hair. Actually, it was someone else, but Mrs. Beaton stole all her recipe books off other people. <laughs> she was a total Simon Cowell in that kind of uh, sort of, you know, so... The record company said, you have to do a single, a video, an interview with the melody maker, an interview with the enemy, make a video, and then if it gets onto top of the box, you have to do it with him. So we did all that, and then when we got there, then they still tried to take it away from you, and it's like, no, yeah. no, nah, nah, we're doing this. We got dropped six months later. I suppose that, that moment where you're in that kind of like situation where, you, you know, you were one of the, the three hottest bands in the country, um, it's an amazing thing historically to go through, really, you know, and it, it, it was a period of time that lasted probably, you know, four or five years, really. Um, and yet in the book, I think you've, you've almost been a bit hard on yourself uh, as a band, artistically, and as, a, as people individually about that period, you know. Is, do you, is there a certain amount of guilt that you didn't quite... I don't know that you didn't deliver in some way or that you didn't behave as you should have done or in No, some way. I don't think that. I think uh, the, the book was more, I feel, not, not I mean, present company excluded, I feel that the, the me, you know, the media or, or music or culture, it's a myth-making machine. Uh, and what had happened is that because we existed between the, the bookends of the Stone Roses' first album and Oasis's first album, a lot of... Uh, lesser journalism by other people has diluted the contribution that we had. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, the NME put like a Manchester special out about five years ago. Uh, there were like, you know, 45, 86 pages. About I wasn't counting them, but there were 86 <laughs> pages. Uh, page 16 was particularly good. Hi there, Pez. You are right? This is, uh, this is Pez who's out of the new fans. So I think you should get a round of applause because new fans are fantastic. Man. And uh, I don't use the next one, it's Mr. Michael Farnell, who I used to collect glasses with in the Hacienda, so I think he should get a round of applause. So I'm not going to go around the rest of the audience, although I do know, I do know who every, every single one of you are, I do know your pin numbers, uh, but I think it would all get too little Scientology-like if I did that. Um, although, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so what was the question? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it, about being hard on the band. Uh, the thing is that because uh, because Noel went on to become so fantastically mm. successful and that's such a great thing, it kind of subsumed the history of what happened before. Mm. So I wanted to produce a kind of work of art, a myth-making work of art which would put the band back into being the center of the discussion of what was going on. Mm. So when people look at it, you, it, you know, you, you, only, you only write book, well, 
I only write books for one reason, and that's to destroy orthodoxies. Mm. My, my concept of writing a book is to destroy orthodoxies. It's like what an eraser head does on a tape machine, or what a lathe does when it's cutting through a bit of metal. Mm. So my intention with the book was to, shape, was to grab people's attention and then make them look at the contribution of what we did as a band differently. Mm. Because in their own ways, you know, all the people in the band, whether it's Clint or Graham or Craig or Martin or Stephen who's in them now, they all are quite remarkable people, but they're all way too modern and so someone actually had to say we were really good mm. and you know and I think the, the the audience for the book has been electrifying because there has been a kind of coll collective cheer mm. of people saying oh thank god somebody actually said it mm. so I think that's uh, I think that's a good thing so the book is quite harsh because I think if you're in that myth making machine you need to know that it's a dynamic machine and you, you, you know you need to get that kind of advice from Peter Hook because you sure as hell ain't going to get it by watching The Voice. Mm -hmm. You know, you like The Voice, the people in the audience in The Voice are made up out of people from G4S. They get paid about 180 quid to stay in the audience for eight hours because they don't want the continuity to change as the programme goes through. <laughs> so even the audience you know, even the audience is on time and a half, and you know, and has had to, you know, has had to do media degrees, you know, in the university of fuck all, you know, and so therefore, it's. It, it, I think it's it is harsh, but we need to be harsh on ourselves because uh, if we're harsh on ourselves, we might not put up with the fuckers in government being hard on our, you know, hard on us. So I think it is harsh, but I wanted a work of art that would actually say for the the two hundred. Well, at our pages, the only thing that mattered was in spiral carpets. So that required to get the uh, microscope out, it required to stick a nail through the butterfly. Mr. Tom Hingley, thanks, thanks so very much. much. If you want to find out what's going on, I'm on Twitter at Tom Hingley Music, so come and. We'll check that out. It's a song called Leaving It All Behind. I've got like an album coming out on Pledge Music next month or a month after called Sounds. So have a look for that yet.
we should be going to. And funny enough, actually playing music is something that you can do quietly. Although people might not think that, so it is something you can actually do quietly. So I think playing music, I used to sing in church, I used to be in the church choir, it's a bit of a return to form, you know, when I was a young lad, we used to, we used to be a church, it was the Church of England Church in Marchant, near, um, near Abingdon, where we used to live, but we used to walk down this, it was like a Thomas Hardy name, we used to walk down this path every Sunday to go and sing at the church and then come back. And on Sunday lunch, you know, I, did, I used to sing in church, that's the first place I sang in, and it's the best acoustics, it's the best acoustics you'll ever hear anywhere. So I think it's, that's a good basis. And also, the, you know, the, the hymns, those stout, you know, sort of Protestant hymns, and the, 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 the lyrics are quite good as well. So I think they're, they're quite good for developing that kind of musical musicality. Yeah, and it was, and you went to lyrics, and, and you tried different uh, instruments, I think, as well, with the trombone. Okay. Well, I <laughs> failed all of them, yeah, really. I mean, I uh, started off trying to play the piano, and I had kind of a, a chain smoking. The other teacher used to tell me about her marital problems at the age of nine, which I was a bit like a kind of musical Jeremy Carl. <laughs> um, then, uh, then, I, then I sort of failed to learn to play the violin and cello and the trombone, but I did learn some of all those instruments. And when I picked up the guitar at the age of 16, it just seemed quite, it just seemed quite natural really playing the guitar. Uh, it was just something that I could impose my own structure on, I think. And then, uh, you mentioned in the book, and it's quite a nice passage actually, where you went to see <coughs> the injury of the blog, I think it was in 78. And was that the moment when you kind of thought I would have been a man that I would be yeah, a man? Yeah, because we went to go and see the injury of the blog, and it was obviously it was part of that new wave and that kind of punk thing where music had become quite manufactured, whether, you know, before that, whether it was an Emerson Lake and Palmer or whether it was basically wrong or something got manufactured. So to see something like someone like the injury playing in such a fantastic band, uh, it really was a big watershed change for music and it was also you know, some of the best music that's ever been played ever, anywhere. And the thing about the game with Injury is that Bob and Fatland, he was a massively sort of charismatic uh, chap because he had polio as a, as a child and, and had overcome these sort of terrible physical uh, problems to be large in life. I mean, he was a very big character. I think that was something you could just, uh, you, could, you know, you could affix to. And also, his, you know, like a couple of years ago, I'm sorry, because you can really say that some people are good without saying other people are rubbish. You know, about six or seven years ago, Kate Nash came along and they said she's like Ian Jury. It's like Kate Neal, it's like Ian Jury. You know, there's some lines in the Jury where I reckon some of the lines, I think he probably spent three weeks writing the line, it wasn't written on the back of a, of a beer man, you know. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a song, If I Was With a Woman, which is really him going on about how terrible he was with women. It's like really actually something just really awful with women. And you know, there's one line that's it's, it's quite it's a Penny Hill, it's quite rude and not doing more tundras, but one bit he just says, If I was with a woman, she'd have to learn to cherish the purity and death of my disdain. I mean that's a fantastic line. I don't think it's out of the novel. I think he came up I think he came up with that line. And that that's better than well that's kind of like something that JP don't leave you, but that's a fantastic line. You know, it's not Kate Nash never wrote a line. Like that, so, yeah. Yeah. Was it one of these moments where you kind of think, well, this is I don't think you think sort of. I don't think you ever do think you made this. I think you always feel like you're sound like you crept in back in church onto the stage and everyone put up with you being there. But I don't think you ever feel like you've really made it because there's no freehold on musical fame. I mean, I think we felt like we'd achieved a lot, and I think we felt that we hadn't compromised that much to do it. And I think. That's one of the things I find a little bit odd about <coughs> the present day reality TV shows, the kind of the X Factors, and it's got talent because you've got all these people trying to copy the template of so it's gone before. But if you want to be really successful, you have to be antithetical, you have to be different to what's gone before. There's a really good book uh, by Tom Wolfe called Painted Word, which is it's a bit like when it's kind of explaining art movements in America in the 20th century. It's quite a good book because it's really intellectual, it's only about 60 pages long, so you can read it in about an hour and a half and then most about the fact that you've read it. <laughs> in that he says every argument in America, if you want to use the idea of arguments in America being like pop movements, he said every argument in America is a drive to make things have less depth, less colour, less form, 
and it was a way of trying to make money quicker. He talks about all these art movements and says that's what Jackson Pollock did, and he talks about the Bobo and Douglas. It's a very funny book. But anyway, he says, you've got any art movement A, art movement B comes along, and that, then art movement C comes along. Well, he said what David Bowie did was he had art, he had music movement A, and then David Bowie came along, but he was music movement G, so no one could become, right. no one could become F. And then he'd become music movement J, so he, he disrupted the whole thing. So I think if you want to be successful in music, you never feel like you've arrived, but the only way you can try and replicate that success is probably to just, it's, it's, to, it's, it's to, to set up a fashion and not to follow. To keep reinventing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. A figure who recurs throughout is, is uh, Noel Gallagher as well, and there seems to be a bit of friction there, but also respect as well. Well, I'm just going to kind of walk over here. Chapter 5, please be called, page 39. One morning in London, I was being driven along in a minibus with Graham Craig and Noel. In front of us in the traffic was a Luton van with its back shutter open. In the back of this van were several large freestanding electric fans. After a few moments of being in the traffic, the board conversation turned to Craig challenging Noel to steal one of the fans to say it was just what he needed to keep him cool with gigs under the lights while drumming. After about three seconds of goading, Noel leapt out of our minibus and unseen by the delivery driver jumped up onto the back of the van. Just at that moment, the traffic in front sped off and Noel, who just fixed his hands on one of the fans, lost his balance and fell backwards. We were fits of laughter as Noel, van and fans sped off into the distance and through a set of lights which turned red in all the dark pursuit. Eventually, we caught up with the van on Marlock Road and Noel scrambled back towards us with the prize in his hands. A snapper up of unconsidered trifles, as Autolycus from Shakespeare's Winter's Tale of King So, I mean, that's quite an important, it's quite an important passage. So, ask you guys again, and then I'll try to answer So, no one could have said Yes, yeah, so he could have character. But then there's friction at times, but there's also respect. And ultimately, when he goes and sets up Oasis, there's, you know, you're very generous in your uh, assessment of them and here. I think that that story there tells a lot about Noel, because the thing about Noel is that. I never knew that he'd audition to sing in the band because although I said before he was one of the three people who came forward to audition in the yeah. band, the band never told me for three and a half years and not work for us, he never auditioned to sing in the band. So that set up an interesting dynamic between me and Noel and me and Noel and the rest of the band because Noel was just power. So what happened was I think that Noel's relationship with the rest of the band deteriorated as it went on and my relationship with him probably got better by the fact that I didn't know that he'd audition to sing in the band. That might have been the motivation for him to not have been terribly positive towards me. But he, I think the thing about Noel is that he picked up a lot of things along the way. And that's part of the reason why that story is in there, like I told you. So the thing about Noel is that, don't get me wrong, because his success, his musicality, his humour, and his songwriting is all his. But I think that the band has been, I think his whole carpet has been slightly incorrectly remembered, which is one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because he writes a book to destroy orthodoxies, well, that's, that's why I write. So I think actually the memory of the band is wrong because people think that his whole carpet is more famous because Noel had not worked for us, but the truth of it is, is if Noel had not worked for us, he would never have been heard of anywhere ever, he would never have happened for him, and that story kind of explains that, because he couldn't have worked for so many because a great band, but their egos were far too big to accommodate him within the band. They couldn't work for Happy Mondays because these two of them were heroin addicts, so they wouldn't have done anywhere. And that, that's the truth of it, whether people like it or not. So what he did was, he kind of limp it like, he kind of stuck on our little Noah's Ark and he went around the music industry and he, he learned, uh, I think, in terms of songwriting and stuff, he certainly learned what not to do by listening to what he did. So, you know, a negative influence can be a big influence. So. But I think he, he wouldn't have been successful if he hadn't worked for it. <coughs> There's only that about it. So the one message I'm trying to get across in the book is if no one would work for us, he would never be heard of by anyone. Yeah. Talk to you, Tom. Like what's going Thanks very much. Well done. Thank you.
sound and tears I have felt falling down upon my shirt. exists is quite a sweet story which started in the 1950s when a couple met in the Rochdale Library, the old one that we used to have, and they fell in love. It's an even happier story than this as it goes on. They fell in love and they got married and they shared their love of books and literature and as time went by they got older and when they started to make their will they decided that they wanted other people to share in what had started their love together. And they 
put a bequest together for Rochdale. And the idea was that the money had to be spent on literature and ideas. And it's their bequest that is currently funding the festival that this event is part of. I'm Steve Cook and uh, I'm from uh, the Arts. We have a regular page in the Watch Observer, Hamed Advertiser and Milton Guardian. We do a radio show and we have uh, outlets in other journals and uh, magazines. But uh, before I welcome uh, Tom to this uh, particular event tonight, this Literature and Ideas Festival event, I just want to say a few words about this person. As you know, he was the lead singer in his spiral carpets. He's a writer, a lecturer, a solo performer. He's also an extremely good conversationalist. And I know this from personal experience, I've had the pleasure of doing an interview with him a couple of weeks ago in the cafe on the third floor of Affleck's Palace. What's going to happen tonight is that we're going to talk about Tom's book, Carpet Burns, which is the only book, I can honestly say, that I've read in a day. I'm the sort of person who reads when he goes to bed and he falls asleep halfway through a chapter and think you might have read it the next day, but you're not sure. But I've read this whole thing in a day because it gripped me. It's a really well written book. It's a book that I would recommend to anybody with even the slightest interest in music or anybody that actually likes good writing. It really is a good book. And I want to welcome on stage now Tom Hingley to talk about his book and then sing you some songs. Tom. I am not getting paid to promote his book at all. It's a genuine like for his book and Tom Solo stuff. And although this might not go down too well with a lot of people in the audience, I'm one of the people that actually thinks that Tom Solo work is better than his early work with the carpets. And I would actually recommend anybody to listen to the stuff. It certainly works for me. Right, to start us off, Tom, we'll start off with the easy bit. Where did carpet burns come from? Uh, well, my dad used to write books. My dad was like an academic at Oxford, and he, um, he was like a—he was an expert in sort of Russian literature, and he translated Chekhov for the Oxford University Press, which took him sort of 35 years. And he wasn't, uh, so he wrote books. So we lived in this big old house in the middle of Oxford, where he used to work at night, work at the night, and sort of sleep in the daytime. So he, he did very much have a kind of writer's kind of that. Well, he, he was a, a writer, really. And my brother is an archaeologist. He writes books. Uh, he's a professor at Durham University, um, and he's written books about Boudicca and about the Romans and stuff. So it's a bit. It's like the family. It's the family store. I think writing books. So I had to write a book, and I think luckily for a first book, I had an interesting story that was kind of self-generated. So you had the content, and uh, just. Yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd, I wanted to write a book and, uh, and and actually one of the things, two things that really helped me writing was just writing everyday emails I think helped me a lot and social networking helped, taught me so I, I wanted to write a book and I wanted to find my own voice about what had happened really. In writing the book one of the things obviously that you're doing is looking back at a younger version of yourself. Did you find that a comfortable experience or an easy thing to look back on and actually put into words for people to read now? Uh, I didn't find it easy, but I think one thing that you, which is probably common amongst everyone who's creative, whether you're like a musician or whether you're an architect or, I don't know, is it you kind of get used to the artefacts that you've created go off and going off and having their own lives, so like you do occasionally turn on the radio and hear one of your old records or you do go in a club and occasionally hear your old records and it's a bit, they're a bit like your old family photo albums, I mean they've, they've taken on a life of their own so I think I was quite used to that idea of peering back at earlier versions of myself which in one way is set in aspect but in another way are changing as time goes on so I think it's probably a bit different for me to write about my past because very luckily because I was in this fantastic band I did kind of create a kind of soundtrack for a generation of people so it wasn't easy, but, but I was used to doing it through listening to my records, you know, over time. Taking you into the book on pages um, 89 and 90, if anybody's familiar with the book, you talk about one of the songs that you actually wrote for the uh, Inspiral Carpets, uh, a song called Please Be Cruel. And you reference uh, songs Waterfall and The Beatles' Dear Prudence, the film The Last Tango in Paris, both Elvises, 
for Stella and Fesley. You also reference in the jazz inspired dot to dot uh, strings of words. You're talking there very much about what the creative process is like for a songwriter. I wonder if you could explain to us how it works for you as a creative artist when you're actually writing a new song. Um, well, I think songs are all different, so there's as many different ways of finding the genesis for a song as there are songs, but sometimes songs do come to you, you might say phrases, and uh, you know you know you might have a phrase that you keep on saying, and you think, well, that I'll, I'll put that in the old knapsack and I'll use it in a song, or sometimes you just might wake, wake up with a melody in your head. Uh, but I think it's, you know, I think being creative is something that if you are, if you are, if you're creative, it's something that you're burdened with, really, in a way. I'm not saying that what you're creating is good, but you're kind of burdened with being creative. So you're gonna, you're going to take ideas and fashion them and change them, and and so I, I suppose there's many different things that inspire songs. Sometimes it can be a phrase that you hear, which is constantly repeated. Sometimes it, it comes from inside you, and you don't really know what the song's about until you know, a year after you put the record out or something like that. So there's as many different songs. Uh, many different ways of composing songs there are songs. One thing just to make, a, I don't know whether you're going to lead on to this, but one thing I found about writing a book is that every paragraph is really a song, really, if you're a songwriter. So did, did you, when you were writing the book, that's how it came to you, did it come to you chronologically, or were you inspired by a particular memory or thoughts? A song think, that you'd heard that reminded you of a period of time? I don't think it was that structured, I think it was just like, uh, you know, if you that desire to actually just get get it out there and in, in, in with the first book it's kind of quite naive it's a bit like Tom and Jerry and I don't know if I don't know if you got with Tom and Jerry and, and Jerry holds up a gun and blasts Tom's head off and this enormous bit of energy comes out the end of the gun and that's almost what writing that book was about it wasn't very controlled and, and then maybe trying to fashion it into something that was a bit more structured is something that happened two or three stages down the road you'd more or less would write a chapter or you'd write a scene and then later on you, you'd fit it into the, the, the superstructure of it. But the initial thing was like a cartoon gun going off in the face. <laughs> is there a number of songs or one particular album that you're sort of most proud of? You look back at that and you think that works, that's what I wanted it to sound like, that's what I would like my grandchildren to listen to and know that was me. Well, actually, my children were very, very unimpressed by the fact that I was in Inspiral Carpets, which I think is exactly how it should be. Um, uh, and it's funny, actually, because my daughter, Sarah, um, she she sent me a text uh, about about 40 months ago saying, I've just been to see the new Simon Pegg film, and they said uh, and there was a scene in one of the pubs that he was in where they, where they were playing, uh, you're, you know, playing this out fields, and your voice came on. Yeah. And he said oh, that was really great, and I, I just wrote the text back, and I said to Sarah, I said it's, it's not impressive that the song was in the film. What's impressive is that you thought it was significant enough to send your dad a text about it. So she's, 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 she's. No, they're really, so they're not impressed by me having been in a band, which I think is good. Really, I think that's a good thing. Really, in terms of cohesiveness in records. I like all the records, it's like saying which one of your children do you like or which one of your children don't you like and so I don't think you can do that with records. So the first record was just a massive um, explosion of dynamism and a lot of things coming together. The second record was an art record which a lot of people didn't like, which actually I think is people's favourite record now, the Beast Inside actually. The third record we were trying to scrape our career back together after doing a difficult second record, so there's a lot of really good pop songs on that. And the fourth record, some of it's not very good, but some of it's very, very good. Satin Fire is very good. I uh, Want You is very good. Um, so I'd say I don't have a favourite. I don't have a favourite album because I think they all, they all have their good points. I don't think we ever made a truly cohesive record, but in, in that period of time. But but I think we made a lot of records that people still love now. So I think a lot of people have come here tonight who are probably burning with the question they'd like to ask. So we would like to ask Tom a question before I continue with my vast array of questions. Would anybody like to ask anything? What's your favourite pie? Oh, sorry? What's my favourite pie? <laughs> my favourite pie? Um, my mum's steak kidney pie, fantastic, yeah, nothing wrong with that. With a little, uh, little thing to hold up in the middle of the crust that looks like a bird flying up in the air. Yeah, that's my favourite pie. It's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> My favourite ever moment on stage 
uh, uh, there's a couple of them. Um, I did a gig playing with three of the guys out of James about three years ago, a charity gig, and that was pretty amazing, really, playing with them. Um, uh, with Inspiral Carpets, I think probably, maybe, the first GMAX gig that we did on the 21st of July, 1919, probably that would probably be the most amazing time on stage. But I, one thing I don't do is I don't watch videos of the band performing because it destroys your actual memory of it. So I try not to watch footage because it just... Uh, and the, yeah, I mean, the only, I mean, there's a few of them. Uh, the, the other time that was really amazing was when the band originally got back together in 2003 after about an eight year hiatus. We played at Brixton Academy. And Brixton Academy, for anyone who hasn't been there, it's, uh, there's about four and a half thousand people in it. You get about three thousand people in the apron in front of you and about two and a half thousand in the doors. And it was sold out. And the stage is 80 foot deep with a slight kind of tilt on it. And uh, between, between 1995 when the band kind of called it a day and 2003 when the band got back together, I, I do about 150 gigs a year and I've done 150 gigs in places, some of which are much smaller than this. And the really weird thing is when we stepped out on the stage and got out to the front of the apron, it was like the reverse of Where's Wally, because actually I knew everyone who was on that. And all 3,000 people were there, so promoter from Shrewsbury there, you know. And so that was that was a weird moment to know, to have that connection with so many people, or not, or not from having been in the band the first time around, but having done events like this, much more sort of community level events. So that was a very special moment.
Thanks a lot for joining us this evening. I don't do covers, I don't even ask me because it's fucking pointless. Thanks a lot and good night. him. The noble Brutus have told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it were a grievous fault. And Caesar hath answered it. Here under Brutus and the rest. For Brutus is an honourable man. So are they all. All honourable men come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend. Noble. Faithful and just to me. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honourable man. He had brought captives home from Rome, whose ransoms did the coffers fill? Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor hath wept, Caesar hath cried. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? Yet Brutus says he was an ambitious man. And Brutus is an honourable man. Caesar was my friend until the last.
here from Scotland, we've got people here from Shrewsbury, we've got people here from Salford, we've got people here from Manchester, we've got people here from Liverpool. God bless every single fucking last one of you.